apologies for the technical difficulties. I'll have to talk a mile a minute to have us get back on schedule. Uh, I'll pretty much just gloss over context history theory, talk about the ugly duckling of interfacial instabilities, the shock-driven Kelvin-Helmholtz instability. Then I will talk a bit more about the multiphase stuff, and I have presently more questions than answers here. So, all interfacial instabilities I'm going to talk about today, namely Kelvin Helmholtz, Rayleigh Taylor, and Meyer Mishkov, uh, share a common formulation. And actually this slide misses the third important scientists, scientist whose contribution to Rayleigh Taylor is frequently overlooked, and I'm guilty of the same as everybody else. The third guy is Lewis. Anyways, uh, the instability develops on a density interface. Uh, above and below the interface, fluids may have different densities and different velocities, and the interface is initially perturbed with a wavelength lambda and uh, perturbation amplitude A0. And Rifmar-Mishkov instability develops if you subject this interface to an impulsive acceleration, whereas in Rayleigh-Taylor instability, acceleration has to go from the heavy fluid into the light fluid. And finally, for kelvin helmholtz instability, you don't need to have impulsive acceleration, you don't need to have any acceleration, you don't even technically speaking, you don't even technically speaking need to have different densities, but as long as there is shear in the flow, there will be vortex formation. And by the way, uh, remembering some references to two-dimensional versus three-dimensional stuff here, this is about as close as you can get to two-dimensional hydrodynamics in a lab. This is soap film. So, with this common formulation, which I'm just going to completely gloss over, you can do statistical, uh, not statistical, completely linear stability analysis, and everything is two-dimensional, and everything is ideal fluid, and um, the interface becomes unstable in the presence of any shear, in the case of Kelvin-Helmholtz, in the presence of acceleration in any direction, if it is impulsive, for Rechmeyer-Mishkov instability, and in the presence of acceleration, acceleration from heavy fluid into light for Rayleigh-Taylor instability. Now, in case we are dealing with Rechmeyer-Mishkov instability, it kind of helps to look at um, the Navier-Stokes equations in the form where you take the curl of both sides, then on the left, you end up with the material derivative of vorticity. And on the right, there is a bunch of terms. But if we are speaking about a shock propagating through an initially quiescent volume, the leading term is proportional to the cross product of gradients of density and pressure. The relevant parameters are the output number, the Mach number, and with Richtmeier's linear theory, we can formulate dimensionless time, which is related to the output number, to the wavelength of the initial perturbation, and to the piston velocity after the shock. Now, let's say we have a density interface, which is at a constant angle to the pressure uh, gradient. In this case, what will happen, at least in first approximation, as these interfaces cross, is there will be a vortex line deposited right on that density interface. And when you are doing numerical simulations, in vorticity formulation. What do you use uh, a vortex line for? 
a shear layer. So, uh, in our experiment, we have to have the heavy gas sulfur hexafluoride with acetone tracer injected and falling straight down due to gravity. So, to create a tilted arrangement of interfaces, we have to tilt the entire shock tube facility. And then we can simultaneously visualize the flow in two perpendicular planes, one of which here I call the center line plane, and this one will be going down the shock tube, and the vertical plane is actually what we see if we look at the tube sideways. So, if you inject an initially cylindrical jet of sulfur hexafluoride, and at an angle, whack at it with a shock. Here, Mach number is 1.7. The initial tilt angle is 30 degrees. And you can actually see in this image where the shock wave is located. And this part is already shock compressed. And this part still doesn't know anything about that shock. And then gradually in the center line plane, you see something long associated with Richtmeier Mishkov instability, a pair of counter rotating vortices. Whereas in the vertical plane, there is a lot of interesting stuff going on. Um, and ultimately, there is something that looks like. Uh, decaying turbulence, and it doesn't just look like it. If you look at the statistics, the statistics very strongly suggest that this is indeed what it is, and over quite a range of scales. So let's look closely at the part where you have this pattern of vortices forming. This looks very much like Kelvin Helmholtz instability, except that you have to take into consideration here you are not dealing with one density interface because it's a plane that is traversing a heavy gas cylinder. There are two density interfaces, plus if you look at the cross product of the gradients of density and pressure, there should be a vortex pattern forming like this. But what's the deal with the dominant wavelength and its dependence on the Mach number? There clearly is a dependence. It is very easily repeatable from experiment to experiment. So uh, we decided to look at what could be the scale that manifests in the formation of these Kelvin-Helmholtz waves. Because the nice thing about Kelvin-Helmholtz instability, it just amplifies whatever you throw at it. But there has to be some kind of a length scale which uh, changes with Mach number. So what could it be? Uh, obviously, uh, we have the diameter of the initial conditions, which is just imposed by the nozzle size that uh, we have to inject our heavy gas into the uh, shock tube. After shock compression, both the initial tilt angle theta and the representative size, the representative size of uh, the gas cylinder, which is no longer cylinder, by the way, it's squished, changes. And so uh, to take into account the effects of uh, both these changes in geometry and shock reflection of the column trailing edge. Uh, so essentially shock will be reflected this way. Uh, we suggest the following representative scale. Compressed size of the column, tangent of the angle between the compressed column and the vertical, Atwood number to power one half, and Mach number to power one half. Now, I wish I had 
like Professor Srinivasan, some compelling physical arguments for these specific scalings. But, uh, well, for Mach number to power one half, there is something I could sort of pull in by its ears from ballistics. But Atwood number to power one half, well, we just pretty much did it by Gosh and by Goli. Although the scaled wavelengths seem to group quite nicely. So here, this gray area is actually uh, corresponding to 95% confidence interval for the wavelengths. So it seems to work. And I'm not going to challenge it too closely. Now, the big assumption here is that everything can be explained with what essentially is a two-dimensional theory. Um, so we don't have the luxury to uh, do a fully two-dimensional experiment, only a quasi-two-dimensional in our three-dimensional world. But in numerics, we can do a two-dimensional curtain to replace the three-dimensional uh, column. And so let me introduce our in-house code, Fiesta, which can be used to model two-dimensional and three-dimensional mixing. And uh, I will refer you to the already published papers for a full description of this code. And the interesting thing about the two-dimensional curtain modeling is that for a curtain, which is completely unlike the cylinder, we still have the same flow pattern in what would be the vertical plane. Moreover, we also get the same scaling trends for the uh, Kelvin-Helmholtz instability. Now, uh, if we switch from two-dimensional to three-dimensional curtain modeling, the trends in the wavelength uh, still persist, but we get a picture which is both phenomenologically and statistically extremely consistent with our experiment. So this is from the GFM paper that just got published. And as you can see here, even the large scale disordered features of the flow closely track what we observed in earlier experiments. I'm talking about this guy. versus this guy. So um, the big question is why hadn't anybody thought of this? And it turns out that there was actually a pre-discovery in 1956, but uh, the author of that paper just noticed that there was something wrong when you had this combination of interfaces and discarded the data. Oh, well, this leads me to uh, the more interesting part of my talk, and this is, I'm just keeping track of time here, um, what happens if instead of an interface in density, so two guesses, for example, you have an interface in average density. So instead of, for example, a volume field with one guess, and the volume field with a different guess, you have a volume of guess and the volume of the same guess, but seeded with particles or droplets. And this is very relevant for quite a bunch of problems. So what happens and does anything happen? And what do we need to understand about what happens in place of really Taylor instability and Richtmeier Mishkov instability. Let's start with really Taylor. So the experiment was literally built by a master's student of mine, Rob White, in the matter of about a day. He just uh, took a tall fish tank, uh, he cut a slit in one of the sides, uh, he found a piece of aluminum that fit in that slit. Then he filled the top of the tank with uh, fog from a commercially available 
fog machine, which is really not fog, it's glycol vapor droplets. And by the way, the stuff that goes into vapes is exactly the same thing. And this is a time sequence of images showing what happens when you pull that piece of aluminum sheeting down. And morphologically, it is very similar to what you see with Rayleigh Taylor instability. And here, the idea was that since these glycol droplets are so small, their individual Stokes number is trivial, the seeding density is low, let us just say that they add density to the volume above the aluminum sheet. Then we can formulate a multi-phase Atwood number based on that density differential. And then you can get yourself the amplitude growth rate, which is entirely consistent with what you expect for bona fide Rayleigh Taylor instability. Now, let's say we have a curtain where the particles are not fully embedded with the flow. Uh, it doesn't really take much. So, for example, if these are even 20 micron versus submicron in the previous case, microspheres, uh, first of all, the Stokes number will be appreciably different. Second, when you have these particles falling in bulk, they do not reach the terminal velocity that would be suggested by the Stokes number. They just keep accelerating. The curtain is pretty much in free fall. And there is an instability of the leading edge of such a curtain, which would be kind of akin to Rayleigh Taylor instability, except that because these guys are in free fall, uh, to measure the perturbation amplitudes, like on this slide, you would have to follow this leading edge in an accelerating reference frame. And in that leading edge, in the accelerating reference frame, the perturbation growth is consistent with linear. So we did some very quick and dirty math here and pretty much came up with a trivial solution. If the curtain was initially non-uniform, the chunks which started accelerated faster will keep accelerating faster, which will account for the quasi-linear growth. Now, let us next, so the lesson here is that this is a different regime than classical Rayleigh-Taylor instability because the particles do their own thing. And once you push the limit in terms of what is the mass fraction of the particles versus the mass fraction of the gas in the same volume, to some point it's no longer hydrodynamics. It's just some kind of weird particle interaction where particles do all kinds of interesting things, but I'm not going to talk about that today. In the remaining one minute or so, of my talk, I'll talk about shock-driven multiphase instability. So it's initially roughly the same setup as for the tank fog experiment. We're using the same fog. We are injecting a vertical column of that fog. And this is what that vertical column does if you whack at it with a Mach number varying between 1.2 and two, and for comparison here, the middle row is fog at different Mach numbers, the top row is smoke at different Mach numbers, and the bottom row is sulfur hexafluoride plus fog. So in all cases, the formation of the counter-rotating vortex pairs is consistent with baroclinic vorticity deposition. The feature growth rate doesn't look particularly consistent 
unless you scale it correctly, although the physics here are completely different because uh, in the case of uh, richtmeier mishkov instability, it's boroclinic vortex formation. In the case of what we call shock-driven multiphase instability, it is the extra inertia of the particles or droplets in the volume dragging the surrounding gas to a slower velocity, which produces shear, which in turn produces vortex formation. The funny thing here is that if again you just smear the mass of the particles over the volume and just scale everything with uh, dimensionless perturbation amplitude and dimensionless time directly borrowed from Richtmeier's linear theory, turns out that even the feature growth rates are consistent. Now, this is where answers and, and questions begin. Because, first of all, multiphase atwood number is the only, is not the only thing that you need to characterize such a flow. Because, uh, well, it describes the added mass due to particles, droplets, or whatever else you put in there, I don't know, bacteria. We actually did some experiments with bacteria. However, this doesn't quite describe the other thing that happens when you hit a volume with particles or droplets with a shock. It is inevitable that even for the smallest particles or droplets that they will decouple from the gas flow. And we need a time scale describing that decoupling. And in turn, that decoupling will also depend not just on the individual particle size, but how many particles are there, what volume fraction they occupy, and how they interact. And just uh, to run on fast forward, this actually is our uh, fog droplet field, and uh, on the right is unseeded, on the left, sorry, on the right and on the left are so they are seeded at the same initial density, but it's double exposed. So you can see droplet pairs. On the left, you can interrogate them and reconstruct the velocity, and uh, you get uh, a pretty reasonable accelerating velocity field. So in the case when the mass fraction is modest and the particle size is modest, you can actually back that time that the particles take to catch up with the flow out. However, if you have a particle curtain with a much higher multiphase that would number and much bigger particles, the surprising thing happens. So this is the initial condition. Um, and this is a long time after the shock has hit the curtain. So you can see, again, a lot of instabilities, some of which could be analogous to hydrodynamic stuff, but the curtain never catches up, at least with the shock tube that we have, the curtain never catches up with the piston velocity of the main flow. So this is where we are pretty much left. And my hope here is maybe we can formulate from first principles some kind of a unifying framework, both for single phase and for multi-phase instabilities. But this is work in progress. Thank you. Questions? Um, I have a question. You mentioned that when you have an inclined uh, plane, mm -hmm. right, then the, the flow that you observe is related to decaying turbulence, right? Well, pretty is it, much. Is it, wait, wait a second. I did not ask the question. Yes. So essentially, it means that there is a some initial energy deposition by the shock wave, right, and after which the flow decays as is. Right? I mean, you keep going, yes. you know, this energy is being decayed, so you consider that as a decaying turbo. Did you try to compare with uh, uh, Professor Mingdahl? Yeah, so I, I was wondering if this could actually be a good test case for Professor Mingdahl's theory, because we have a very finite uh, 
and very tightly quantified initial geometry and energy input, after which we can again very tightly quantify the evolution of the velocity field and density field. If I may, if I may ask a second question, because there were experiments of Meshkov, Evgeny Meshkov, where he was considering like um, not only an interface dynamics, it was essentially Rayleigh Taylor and Richtmeier Meshkov driven dynamics, but he was focusing on the shear, which is not a constant value this time. So velocity, the shear velocity is not a constant value. It's a time dependent value, accelerating or decelerating in time. And he was observing different behaviors, like, you know, more disordered or more laminar, depending whether this velocity is accelerating or decelerating. Do you have something similar in your experiments? Uh, in a sense, our experiment are less interesting than the original experiments of Meshkov. First of all, we don't have an oxygen acetylene mix and a spark plug salvaged from an old military truck to trigger our shock wave. So everything is much better controlled. And um, our goal originally, and the goal of our funder, was to provide the initial conditions due to a single instability with a well-known perturbation amplitude and Mach number. And if I may, my concluding question, I would like to mention that, you know, your alpha number 0 0.05 is very similar to what was obtained in the seminal simulations by Professor Glim from tracking method 0 0.07, 0 0.06, based on a really deep knowledge of the partial differential equations. So you might be in a good position yeah, here to interact with various Yeah, and obviously we referenced Professor Glim's paper. This is great, yes. So let us applaud our speaker. And let us proceed to our next talk.